be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy, and I will give thanks to him in song. The Lord is the strength of his people, a fortress of salvation for his anointed one. Save your people and bless your inheritance. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. Blessed be the reading of the Lord's word from Psalm 28, verses 6 through 9. Good morning, church. I want to welcome you as we join together in songs and scriptures and hearing the word of God today. I pray that this would be a time that enriches you this morning, that it would be a time that would instill in your heart the need for us to be unified with one another and that we would grow more deeply in our faith and that our hearts would be transformed by the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, just as our Creator God the Father would have wanted for us. And so I pray that this morning as we join in song and as we hear these scriptures and hear the Word of God, that you too would feel that presence of God this morning.
church family let's have a time together again with those who are feeling young at heart and some of you aren't maybe feeling that way in these days but uh, follow the example of your kids and your grandkids and let's sing and have the actions together singing first is banner over me is love Jesus is the rock of my salvation's banner over me is love Jesus is the rock of my salvation's banner over me Love. Jesus is the rock of my salvation's banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. And don't you know that God loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. Hallelujah, God loves you and I love you and 
that's the way it should be. He set straight paths before my feet. His bare only is love. He set straight paths before my feet. His bare only is love. He set straight paths before my feet. His banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. And don't you know that God loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. Hallelujah, God loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. He is the shepherd and we are the sheep. His banner over me. Love. He is the shepherd and we are the sheep. His banner over me is love. He is the shepherd and we are the sheep. His banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. And don't you know that God loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. Hallelujah. God loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. He invites me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. He invites me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. He invites me to his banqueting table, his banner over me is love. His banner over me is love. And don't you know that God loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. Hallelujah, God loves you and I love you and that's the way it should be. All right. Oh, Jesus loves me, right? <clears throat> Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me. He who died, heaven's gates to open wide. He will wash away my sin. Let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. He's prepared a home for me, and someday his face I'll see. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you love us so much. I pray that you would help us to learn to love you more each day. 
Thank you for being our friend. Thank you for saving us from our sins. Thank you for being with us every day. Mm -hmm. Amen. Good morning and thank you for joining us on this fine Sunday morning. I'm so glad to be able to have each and every one of you with us. Uh, just a few announcements. Uh, if you're interested in being part of one of our life groups, the information is over here on our left, uh, as well as you'll be able to find everything on our website, newingtonwest.ca. Uh, we do have, on July 6th, a new life group coming up, and that is our Open Dialogue life group. And that's going to be Monday nights uh, at 7 p.m. And this life group is particularly going to be focusing on how do I have a conversation of importance without worrying about offending someone? How do I have a conversation where the stakes are really high and I can't afford to mess up because it will destroy everything I've been working for. Or how do I, how do I display dissatisfaction? And there's so many times when we go to talk and our emotions are, you know, just flooding us and we don't know how to say. And so the open dialogue is how do I enter into this conversation? And what are the tools that I can use to make sure that I am not just displaying dissatisfaction or I'm not just, you know, saying my frustrations, but I'm actually having a conversation that is going to lead to, to change being done. And so that is our open dialogue. I, I would love to have people join. That's going to be led by myself and Olivia is going to be joining in uh, for, for some hands-on activities at points. And so that is starting July 6th. I would love to have people. If you're interested, please let me know. Uh, you can either email me, you can Facebook me, uh, you can call me. There's no book required. It's just a great way for us to learn how exactly we can start having crucial conversations and uh, be able to use our dialogue to help progress in relationships and in expressing how it is that we feel. Uh, however, before that, on July 5th, we are going to have a hallelujah honk. That's right, I, I, didn't, I, I didn't stutter, a hallelujah honk. Uh, we are going to be meeting in our cars and we are going to just be praising the Lord together. Uh, we're still working on the details as far as the time and what all that is going to look like, but that is going to be Sunday, July 5th. And so I want you to put that on your calendar, Sunday, July 5th, hallelujah honk. Uh, we will be gathering together following restrictions and regulations to be able to worship together on some of the things that the Lord has done this year, some of the things that the Lord is going to do, and just being able to gather together as a fellowship of believers. So we have the New Life Group starting July 6th, Open Dialogue, and then we have on July 5th, that Sunday, we are going to be having a Hallelujah Honk. This is our time for uh, tithes and offerings. Uh, I would encourage those of you that call Newington your home to please continue to, to give in support of the ministries that we support. I was in an update on one of the ministries that we support uh, the other day, and God is doing some great things through World Hope, uh, families being uh, re, uh, brought back together, uh, restored, there's the word I was looking for, uh, women being drugged out of uh, sex trafficking and being given a new life and a new start. And that's one of the ministries that we support. And so your, your tithes and offerings go towards that and help support that. Uh, there are three different ways to give with the information is to my left uh, as well. You can find it on our website. And just know that all this money is going towards uh, ministries that will help the gospel, that will help bring reconciliation, that will help bring solidarity and there's so much going on in the world, not only with coronavirus, but lately with these protests. And uh, the Wesleyan Church and Newington wants to be able to do what we can do to make sure that the gospel is told. To make sure that people have the hope of Jesus Christ. And so uh, please encourage you to continue to give. We're going to spend uh, just uh, a moment in silence. And, and the reason for spending a moment in silence uh, is to reflect upon the state that our world is currently in. Not only are people separated from being able to worship together rightly, but in the midst of that, we have social movements for equality. And so I just want to spend a moment 
in silent, a full minute in silence, lifting our hearts up to the Lord, lifting our burdens up to the Lord and praying on behalf of those who are struggling right now. Let's, let us start. Father God, we know that you are in charge. We know that you care for every creature that you created. We know that you care for every single human that walks this earth because your son came down on the cross to die on our behalf. Jesus, we pray for your redemptive blood to be transforming in our lives. Holy Spirit, we pray for a moving in this world, for a moving in America, for a moving in Canada, where we react not out of our own thoughts and our own prejudices and our, our own values, Lord, but instead that we will have kingdom values. Holy Spirit, that you will change us so we have kingdom thoughts. I think about your words on the Sermon of the Mount. After you told us not to worry, you said, but seek first the kingdom and its righteousness. Father God, I pray that that will be our hearts today, that, that we will seek your righteousness, that we will seek seeing your kingdom here on earth. Jesus, there is so much that is going on in this world. There are so many who need to know about the love that you have. There are so many that need to know about the power of your blood. There are so many that need to be restored. We pray for the power of your blood to work. Holy Spirit, we pray for your fire and transformation to take place. Father, we pray and ask that your loving arms will be felt. That lives will be changed. That this will not be something used for the enemy. That this will not be used as something that divides. Lord, but that we will see People come into the kingdom. People come into your family. Thank you for all that you're doing, even behind the scenes that we cannot see. Thank you for your transforming powering. We pray that we will humble ourselves. That we will humble ourselves to allow you to speak into our lives and into our situations. That we will be slow to speak quick to listen, and slow to become angry. We pray that you will bless the tithes and the offerings that are given, that they will be used for the building of your kingdom, for the spreading of the gospel, that you will bless both the giver and the gift, so that people will see that you are a God that is in control. We pray this all in the powerful name of Jesus Christ and by his blood. Amen.
other we will work side by side we will work with each other we will work side by side and we'll guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride and they'll go we are christians by our love by our love yes they'll know we are christians by our love all praise to the father from Father God, I pray that you would teach us this unity, that you would teach us the unity and the way to be your disciples as you called the disciples in the upper room to show the love of God and the love for one another. And that is how people would know that they were your disciples. May we also live in that kind of unity today with one another and with you, O oh Lord. We pray that your spirit would be recognized as being present in this place, in our hearts, and that we would act with unity, as Pastor Dave has called us to over the last few weeks in prayer. I pray that this would be a moment where you would shine through so clearly and that lives would be transformed. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Matthew 28, verse 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age.
dragged his blanket down the hallway and slowly he started to open the door to his, his parents' room and he stood in the doorway. Daddy, Daddy. Dad slowly gets up out of bed. What, what is it? What is it, buddy? There, there's, there's, a, there's a monster in my room. Can, can, can you please, can you, can, can you come help me? All right, buddy, I'll, I'll come. And his dad swings his legs out of bed and he scuffles with his son, his hand on his back down the hallway. And he opens the door and he turns the light on him and he searches under the bed and he pulls the, the curtain out and he looks behind the curtain and he opens the door to the closet and he looks in the closet and he closes it and he says, all right, buddy, there's, there, there's no monsters, you're safe. And he takes his son and he, he tucks him into bed and turning the light out, he goes back. The next night, the boy shuffles with his blanket, opens the door, Daddy, Daddy, there's a monster in my room. <sighs> All right, buddy. Does the same thing, turns on the lights, checks the curtain under the bed, door. Buddy, there's no monster. Tucks him in. Goes on. Next night, next night. Till finally, the, the father's realizing that there's, there's this belief, there's this idea that the son is scared of something in his room. And so uh, he, he sets to work on something. And the next night, when the boy comes shuffling down, Daddy, Daddy, there's, there's a monster in my room. The dad rolls out of bed and he says, all right. And he, he grabs this, this sword made out of cardboard that he had made and he grabs this trash can as a shield and he says, let's go, buddy. And he walks confidently with his son down the hall and he opens the door and he turns on the light and he says, if there's any monsters in here, I want you to know that you're not bothering my son anymore. And he gets down on his knee and he looks under the bed and he starts stabbing with the sword and swinging. Ah! 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 And he gets up and he goes over to the curtain and he, ah, 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 and he attacks the curtain. And finally, he turns to his son and he says, I'm going, I'm going to the closet, buddy. I'll be back. And he, he opens the door to the closet and he steps in. And the boy doesn't know what's happening, but he can hear something slashing in the closet. And he can hear, ah, get back, get back. Ah. And he closes the door to the closet and he says, all right, buddy, the monsters are gone. And the boy looks up at his dad. And there, there's this expression on his face. And he tucks him in, kisses him on his forehead, and then turns off the light. And the next night, the boy doesn't come shuffling in the middle of the night to his parents' room to ask to be checked for monsters. See, the boy had in his mind this idea that there was something in his room. There was something under the bed. There was something behind the curtains. There was something in the closet. But when the dad took the action to fight the monster, not just to check and scare it away, but to get rid of him for good, what the boy thought what the boy believed changed because the monster was no longer there. Daddy had defeated them. Today, what I want to talk about is belief. I want to talk about belief. And a lot of times we use the word faith interchangeably with belief. But the reason I'm choosing the word belief is because a lot of times when we use the word faith, which can be used interchangeably, we, we use it in a broader spectrum, right? Faith can be used in a lot of words. So I'm going to use the word belief. And the scripture that we're going to be reading today is Genesis 15, verses 1 through 11. Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is Eliezer of Damascus? 
And Abram said, Have you given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir? Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is of your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed they can be counted. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. So he also said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chalcedians to give you the land that is for your pres- to take possession of it. But Abram says, Sovereign Lord, how can I know that I will gain possession of it? So the Lord said to him, Bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these things to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite of each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then birds of prey came down on the carcass, but Abram drove them away. There's a few things that are significant in this vision that Abram has. The first is the fact that they take place after the events that we see in chapter 14. They take place after Abram has chosen to accept the blessing that Melchizedek was going to give him and not accept the blessing and the gift that Sodom was going to give him. And for us, it kind of seems like, well, duh, you know, but something we need to understand is that in the tradition of the Jewish people and the early Hebrews, this was an orally told story. As in, it was told verbally, right? It was oral. It wasn't written down. And God makes this connection, right? And he does this by using the same words. The same words that Melchizedek used, saying, May the Lord deliver you from your enemies. Part of the blessing that Melchizedek gives is the same word that God says, saying, Abram, I am your shield. And so God makes this connection of Abram, because of what you have done, because of your choice with Melchizedek, I am your shield, I am your reward. And it, it's so significant in this vision because not only is God greeting him saying, look, Abram, I am with you, I am your reward, I am here to bless you. But we also see for the first time in scripture, the use of the words believed, righteousness, and vision. This is the first time in scripture that we see these three words. And the, significant, the significance of it is the fact that Abram believes before any proof is given to him other than the fact that God said, I am your reward. Abram says, look, I don't have an heir. I don't have someone. So God, I understand you're my, you're my reward and you said I'm going to be this great nation, but it's going to come through, through this servant that I have. And God says, no, no, it's not. It's going to come from your own flesh and blood. And based on that, based on nothing else, simply what he knew of God, simply of this connection that God had made that I am going to bless you and that I am coming to bless you, just as Melchizedek said, just as I was your sword and shield and I delivered you from the fight that you just had to rescue Lot. Based on just that, no other proof, Abram believes Abram believes, and God credits that to him as righteousness. Or, to look at it another way, Abram has deepened his relationship with God. He has deepened his relationship with God. And the first time that we see a vision, the first time that we see a vision, it is not God giving a vision of, here's the doom and destruction that's going to happen. Here's, you know, a foresight into all the negative things. But the first time that God interacts with Abram, and Abram replies, right? This is the first time Abram replies to God. Up till now, he simply acted. But what we see is not only does he believe, not only is there righteousness, but the vision that God gives is a vision that's leading to a deeper relationship, a deeper understanding, and of restoration. It's a vision that says, look, I am going to give you your descendants. You are growing in a deeper relationship with me. And then later on in the second vision also given there, he explains and he gives reason. 
See, belief is a verb. Belief is a verb. Though he had no heir, Though he had no markers to identify, okay, this is what's going to happen, Abram, then this is going to happen, then this is going to happen. Which actually occurs later in chapter 15. If you read along and if you look ahead in verses 12 and everything, God actually says, here are some markers that show what's going to happen. You're, you're not necessarily going to have the descendants right now, but you are in 400 years. Before any of those markers... Before he even has this flesh and blood heir, Abram believes. Belief is a verb. It drives us into action. I think kind of one of the best ways to think about is that belief leads to our judgment. Judgments lead to our actions. Actions lead to our lifestyles. And our lifestyle leads to a culture. See, Abram believed God. He believed what God was saying. And because of that, he made a judgment that I can trust this God, even though the only things I know about him right now is that he is blessing me and that he protected me when I went to go rescue Lot. That's the extent of what he understands according to what we know. In his first interaction with God, he brings before him, look, you're blessing me. I can see that. And I'm paraphrasing here, but, but what, <clears throat> is it not going to come through my own air? Is, is this how it's going to be, God? And then he says, well, how can I know? And God does this act, right, in the vision. And he says, bring me animals. And you have to understand the significance because what God is about to do when the animals are cut in half and God passes through later on is he's saying, may I cease to be God. May I cease to be. May I be destroyed if I do not do what I have promised for you, Abram. That is the significance of the vow that is being made. But before that vow even happens, Abram believes. His belief leads to a judgment. Uh, I would say a, a snap action judgment given what, what we see of I, I can trust this God. And so I'm going to ask for something to happen. It then leads to actions later on when we read in chapter 16 and chapter 17, actions even further than the ones that he's been taking following this God, following Yahweh. And that then leads to a lifestyle that he has and ultimately a culture that will be ingrained in the Hebrew people, that will be ingrained in the Jewish culture. Belief is a verb. One thing that I find so interesting is that one of the first things that a child develops, right? And, and there's a whole bunch of cognitives, but as far as, as socially and things like that, one of the first things that a child develops is trust. One of the first things a child develops is trust. Can I trust mommy or daddy? Can I trust this person? Before any other social, like, I, and I'm talking like relational, they, just, they establish of can I trust or can I not trust? Trust is the first thing established. Belief, belief that this person is not going to do me harm or that I can rely on that person. Jesus calls us and says that we are to have the faith of a child. And again, I said I was going to use the word belief for this sermon. We are to have the faith of a child. We are to trust even before we necessarily see what is going to happen. Belief is a verb. Not only are we called to have belief as a child... Right? We're, suppo we're supposed to trust even though we necessarily don't see what's going to happen. But in James, James wrote and said, you show me your faith and I'll show you my faith. And I'm paraphrasing here because I don't have it open. But you show me your faith through words and I'll show you my faith through deeds. Right? I'll show you my faith through what I do. Faith has action to it. Belief has action to it. 
Belief is not simply, simply just hanging on to something for no reason. It shapes how we act. It shapes what we do. And what we see in this passage is that Abraham's belief simply comes on what he knows of this God. Simply comes on what he has experienced so far. Belief is a verb. Belief led Martin Luther King Jr. to start a movement. Belief led Martin Luther King Jr. to, to stand before hundreds of people and say, I have a dream that one day people will be viewed equally regardless of color. Belief led William Wilberforce to say that we are not to treat people as though they are property. Even though it took him decades to get a law passed that said we would not sell people anymore. And yet still today, we see inequality. And still today, we see women being sold, children being sold in sex trafficking. They had belief that something would happen even though they didn't see it yet. They had belief and they took action just as Abraham did, even though it wouldn't be for years, even though it wouldn't be for decades, even though it wouldn't be within their lifetime of seeing it changed. There would be a step. There would be a process that was starting that wasn't started before. Terry Fox started running to raise, raise awareness for cancer when it seemed like no one in Canada cared to give cancer any kind of research. And he kept running and he kept going so people would know that this is a disease that needs to be fought. John Humphrey wrote hoping that people would be treated equally the Universal Declaration of Rights and Freedoms, which has been accepted, if reworded a little bit, by the UN and several other places around the world. Belief is a verb. What we believe should always lead to action should always lead to trust. What we believe and think about God should lead to a deepening in our relationship with him. It should lead to a deepening of our trust in him. That's what it did for Abraham, for Abram. Based on the few things that he has experienced, the first time, the first time that he interacts with God, he chooses to believe and to act. And yeah, the first act that he says is, can you give me proof? And God takes it up a notch and he says, I'll give you proof. I'll give you proof, Abram. May I cease to be God if what I promise you doesn't come to be. May I cease to be as this ruler, maker of heaven and earth, the deity that you worship if this doesn't come true. And Abram continues to believe. And you know the crazy thing? Is later on, when he shares what his descendants, when God shares what in, the, in a second vision what Abram's descendants are going to go through, when he shares the things that are going to happen to him, Abram still believes and still wants to follow, even though it's difficult, even though it's not going to happen right away. Belief is a verb. It should compel us into action. It should compel us, like Abram, to fight off vultures that are coming to interfere with the promise that God has had. And by the way, vultures in a vision means trouble. That, that's one of the meanings of vultures and visions. It means trouble. It means the, those that are going to come and try and destroy and to pick, part, pick things away, pick things apart. And instead, Abram protects the promise. He protects the carcasses that are there because he believes. Belief should, is a verb and it should compel us into action. Belief also means, and this is one way of looking at it, 
is that we're trusting in the yet and not yet. People who have strong belief see what is current, but they also know what is to come, what could be. And so while they're trusting that something will happen here, they know that when God's kingdom come, they know that when the promise is fulfilled, they know that when finally the equality comes, when finally everything happens, it's going to be beautiful. Belief is trusting in the yet, not yet. In the, this is what we're seeing here, but this is what it could be. And that's what spurs them on. That's what spurs them to keep going. And so I want to ask you today, I want to challenge you. What's one thing you can do to act on your belief? What is one thing that you can do to act on your belief? Whatever it is that you believe. Whether it's racial equality whether it's we need to seek holiness first, whether it's that we need to share the gospel before anything else. What's one thing you can do to act on your belief? Maybe it's not reposting something on Facebook. Maybe it's taking a second to think before you respond to what someone says. Or maybe it's actually listening to what someone says. And not just writing them off because they have a different opinion or they have a different view than you. Maybe it's speaking truth or love into a situation. Maybe it's helping someone out by teaching them a trade or a skill. What's one thing you can do to act on your belief? This week, what's one thing you can do for those of you who might be struggling right now in the midst of all this, my second challenge is this. What do you need to see to believe? What do you need to see to believe? Abram believed because God said, look, I am your blessing. I am going to bless you. Just as Melchizedek said, because you chose to accept his blessing, because you've chosen to be faithful to me, I am going to bless you. And Abram chose to believe because he saw what God did. He listened to the promise God was giving. And again, I, a lot of times I think, you know, we think about this and we think about it in the context of God to human, but think about it in the context of a relationship. One person talking to another, look, I've seen what you've done. Olivia, I saw everything that you've done, and I trust you because of that. Pastor Dave, I trust you because I've seen what you've done so far, and I see what you're doing. Don, I trust you because I know what you're doing, and I saw what you did for me. And so I'm willing to put my trust in you. When we think about it in that context, what do you need to see to believe Jesus' words? What do you need to see to believe God's promise of salvation? My challenge this week, as we look at the fact that belief is a verb, that belief calls us into action, just as Abram, is what's one thing you can do to act on your belief? And the second is what do you need to see in order to believe? Baby.
go, that the spirit, that the refreshing spirit, that the empowering spirit, that the restorative spirit of our living God is with you. I pray that you will go forth living on what you believe, living on the promises of God, and that we will see lives changed. Go empowered by the Holy Spirit and covered in the blood of Christ. Amen.